So I'm going to dive a little bit into the data itself now. And um, the biggest challenge of the, with the data, of course, is just the sheer scale of it, volume. So with satellite data, you can imagine hundreds and hundreds of environmental signals measured for every pixel on Earth every day for many decades. Uh, some of the non-satellite data is also very, very large scale. You know, there's data coming in on a daily basis from over 100,000 weather stations. Some of that data goes back several hundred years. So the earliest data series, I think, goes back to the 1700s. There are also challenges related to the data formats, whether it's how the globe is projected into, into two-dimensional rasters, so satellite projections, dealing with optical character recognition to extract text data embedded in images that's extremely obscure but very valuable. Uh, of course, dealing with um, lots of different human languages, because this data is reported from all over the world. Uh, dealing with data coverage, um, data quality issues, ranging from the way it's collected by human beings, uh, with surveys and so on, could, could have lots of errors. Uh, even the satellites could have cloud interference, which means some of the data is not available all the time. And also, we deal with obscure things like units that are very particular to certain regions of the world and, and uh, of this particular industry. So that, that, that covers the data. Now let's talk a little bit about how we organize the data, or what we call the ontology. And this is implemented as a knowledge graph. Uh, the ontology makes us deal with t fundamental things like time, for example. We're not just dealing with time series as just you know, a clock ticking. But we really have to understand time uh, more fundamentally, whether it's crop growth cycles, understanding seasonality, um, how things progress biologically. We also have to understand what the data is about very deeply. You know, there's dozens and dozens of varieties for just wheat, for example, and, and we have over 10,000 different items or crops. And it's not just the genetic varieties, it's where it grows, how it grows, uh, it's what categories they belong to, fruits, vegetables, cereals, and so on. All these things are extremely important to how the data is organized and ultimately used. And also things like well, it's not just the crop itself, but how much protein is in a particular crop, and those, that influences the ontology a lot, or how much sugar is inside a particular plant. And then geography, you'd think it's fairly straightforward, but it's actually very complicated when you're dealing with this historical data. Now, what does it mean? What does EU mean? It, it means many different things depending on what period of time you're looking at. So understanding all these things and mapping them correctly is enormously important to having uh, good data. Putting all this together, we, we currently have about 55 million data series. This number is doubling every six months. So we expect it to reach about 200 million by the end of next year. And these 55 million data series contain 650 trillion data points. So what do we do with all this data? And, and how does this actually start to get applied to swine fever in China, which is what's killing the pig herd. Well, to model that simple, seemingly simple question, you're essentially modeling the interplay between supply, demand, trade, and price for every combination of every commodity over and over again. And then you have to multiply that by each country. Right? Because for each country that China is connected to, there, you know, a slight shift in something in Argentina has a ramification to the Chinese consumer. A slight shift by the Chinese consumer could have ramifications to a consumer in Kenya. And you have to be able to capture that. And so this is kind of the loop that we're essentially closing and building out.